This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week's episode has been brought to you by Manscaped and The Spectator Magazine. Support for Walk-In's Welcome comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your man's family jewels. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Do your ladies a favor. Hit manscaped.com up and use the code WALKIN. They'll thank you. The Spectator is the longest running magazine in the English language and it's now getting ready to launch its US edition. And yours truly writes for them. If you sign up now, you'll get your first issue free. So just go to spectator.us slash subscribe and use offer code WALKIN. This week, I was excited to sit down with the brilliant Melissa Chen. Melissa is the New York editor of Spectator USA. She's also managing director of Ideas Beyond Borders. Born in Singapore, she has always been very vocal about the necessity of free expression and education as guarantors of human rights and democracy. I felt my brain growing talking to Melissa. She's so brilliant, and I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed sitting down and talking to her. I'm with Melissa Chen. Welcome to Walk-Ins Welcome. Hello, Bridget. How are you? Good. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. So tell us about yourself. Where are you from? What do you do? Who are you other than gorgeous and brilliant? Who is any of us? <laughs> um, so I was born in Singapore. Okay. And I immigrated to the U.S. when I was about 17. I always said I came for an education, but I stayed for the civil liberties, which is, which is true. I, I very much was very, like, I knew that living here, the first step to wanting to, to live here as a legal immigrant involved getting an education. <laughs> Some of my listeners were already calling ice. I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> they have their finger on the, and they're like, oh, okay, I guess I'll keep right, listening. <laughs> so yeah, I went to, I went to Boston University. Uh, first place I, I lived in, in the U.S. was Boston. Okay. And um, loved it. Uh, loved and fell in love with the sports teams, the, uh, the culture there. It was so liberating because I grew up in a place that was very, it was a nanny state, you know, they call it a benevolent authoritarian state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and it's funny because this was the escape from that. You right. Know? And I, it was just liberating to be able to, to know that you can say anything and, and, you know, we, and it was just a libertine culture, anything goes. And this was like around 2005. So when you say it's liberating to say anything, Explain what it was like growing up not being able to say anything. Were, what couldn't you say? Well, there were very clear out of bounds markers. For example, offending the religious feelings or disrupting social harmony was considered a crime. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that if you have a law that you know is so vaguely phrased that almost anything can be interpreted to be offending or, or disrupting social harmony. So in particular... <laughs> because it's a multiracial, multi-ethnic society, they're very sensitive to any talk that disparages ethnicity or religion. Okay. So if you're a Christian or if you're even an atheist, you know, insulting Christians, for example, would be considered against the law. Right. Insulting Christianity. At the end of the day, private talk is one thing. Now you put that online, you're, you're writing a blog, you're saying it in a YouTube video, that could get you jailed and it has happened. Wow. It's, you know, there is precedent to this. In general, there's just this this understanding. It's kind of unspoken. Over time, when when these laws exist, people end up self censoring. Right. So topics become like sensitive, and it's like it's like a it's like a landmine. Mm -hmm. They're kind of there. We know we're not supposed to say anything that disrupts social harmony, mm -hmm. but you don't know until you step on it and it blows up in your face. And what happens when it blows up in your face? You get jailed. Right. You, you know, I mean, it all depends on people filing. You know, you, you see these reports in the UK about people filing police reports because they didn't, like somebody offended them in a right. joke. We got, Singapore is a former British colony. We got a lot of our laws 
from you know the from colony. the British penal code <laughs> as a colony. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there are these institutions and and you know processes in place when a certain thing action gets you know gets you reported to the police. Well, they're going to investigate and then it right. escalates and it forms this whole thing. So people generally just there's this like PC general like you know sanitized kind of PC culture mm-hmm. that that just some topics are not really got they just don't don't go into that general rule so does this breed kind of a black market of ideas you know is there an underbelly in singapore that's very how does this repression i feel like anytime you do this there's a shadow that gets cast there is and many expats from you know who, who live and work there will tell you in some ways you know it's like because anything seen as overtly racist would be kind of clamped down in mm-hmm. terms of speech, right? But when you're there privately at the bars and you're talking colloquially, people have very reductionist ideas about race. Mm. And it just comes out. It's, mm-hmm. it's pretty fleet, free-flowing on, on that conversational level at the you know the markets or at the restaurants, or the pubs. But it's not dealt with. It's just, it's just not talked about honest conversations you know on on the uh, in a public sphere Mm -hmm. so and and if you're an opposition leader in in politics it's difficult for you to even address these topics that's the whole idea it's you know if you're authoritarian in general you can use certain laws to hoard power to make sure that you create a rhetorical space where no one can assail you right your ideas right that's the point of it right so it's a useful thing. <laughs> yeah, it is a useful tool for silencing dissidents. <laughs> right, right. And and when I when I came to America, I realized. I mean, it was just it was liberating because I knew First Amendment was you know was was this shield that protected everybody. Mm-hmm. The government can't come after you. Mm-hmm. And not to say obviously that that you know there are no consequences for your speech. Obvious. Yeah. And, and yeah, of course. But I think people get this confused a lot too. Yeah. Is that you'll see people kind of being playing the victim in this culture and saying, this is a first amendment and I, I have free speech. Well, okay. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you just get to have no consequences for your speech. Obviously saying something you you'll get pushback. Right. And there's, there's so many incidents now. I feel like there should be like a, a website that monitors all these things. Like, like, I don't know, like who's the latest person to get canceled and why? Right. Because, yeah, you know, from Kathy Griffin, the comedian, who right? Did the, the head thing, mm-hmm. um, to Mark Lamont, was it the guy who got fired for saying something anti-Semitic on CNN? Mm-hmm. Uh, from CNN, mm-hmm. and then Kathy Ju recently with Miss World. Okay, so there are all these like incidents, and they're happening on both sides. Mm-hmm. Right? They are happening on both they sides. Are. And and how do we view these issues? Is it you know masterpiece, the cake? the the cake a bakery oh right right baker who didn't want to bake a wedding cake for mm-hmm. a um, gay couple like these are all kind of in the same wheelhouse yeah and at least that one was i mean i feel like they're not all litigated though you know no, <laughs> no, so no. at least generally it seems like it plays out in the public space and that's what's interesting when you live in and i'm i've said this on multiple podcast I've done as a guest that self-censorship starts in the mind it does and or censorship starts in the mind with self-censorship and it's almost like you have to lay this if if it's not being enforced externally you have to lay the psychological groundwork for it to be accepted and what's interesting about the time we live in now is that when you describe what happens in an authoritarian state and the the you know the they come in and they enforce this now it seems like we have this mob that enforces these it's still a vague who gets to decide what is quote unquote hate speech for example or who gets to defi- decide what's so offensive somebody should lose their job but it seems like it's just this nebulous mob yeah that can take any form and appear out of almost nowhere right and it's in some ways more terrifying in some ways because it's not consistent because it's social and it's not consistent yeah i should agree with that because 
in the Singapore government's case, it's very clear what you shouldn't talk about. Mm-hmm. And everyone just avoids it. Mm-hmm. Like the, the boundaries are, are clearer. And it's the people be the government in, in some respects. Yeah. You're you you are all kind of united. And I feel I, and I might be wrong, but in some respects, it seems like there's some solidarity amongst the people that there's the the govern the authoritarian government and then the people who live under under that. Yeah. Whereas and I'm sure there's their social contract, right? They actually voted for, for, to, for this government to stay in power. Mm-hmm. One party since 1965, since independence. They love this government. That's, right. There's no reason for them to vote otherwise. And, and it's been consistently, they've been consistently elected. So there are fair elections in this country. So right. It's not, I, mean, I would say it's a, it, it is a democracy by most, you know, by most measures. It's just a bit authoritarian in the sense that there's kind of one party. <laughs> right. Then, and the, the kind of laws that are in place that, that keeps them in power generally it's you know it, it's been difficult to to depose them but that also means i mean but you can start an opposition party so it's it's still free in that res, in that respect right but compared to to the mob here i i i don't actually really don't know you know if you gave me a choice now i think that was the part where i started kind of getting into this world this world of ideas and like participating in the online sphere was when i started to realize the very thing i was escaping was here Interesting. And in this form. Interesting. And this amorphous mob. Is that- there a social mob in Singapore? Are there people that will kind of uh, cancel other people or report you to the government? Or how I mean, does. Yes, because that's why you have those police reports. Right. Right. Because I think uh, the threshold is like if five people file a police report over something you said, mm-hmm. the, the government, they, they, they will investigate. actually investigate. Mm-hmm. The, the, Police will, and then it escalates from there. You might get jailed, and it has happened. Mm-hmm. So there is, but but it's not the way it is like here, right? Like with the Twitter culture, and you know, people trying to to constantly look out and dig up old tweets and use that against you. No, that does not that does not exist. Interesting. So tell us more about what you're doing presently in this world of ideas. So you went to school in Boston and yeah. I love Boston. And then yeah, we what did you get your Patriot? I know <laughs> that's how we bonded too. at yeah. first on yeah. Twitter.com. I, exactly. So then when did you, sorry, what were you going to say? Oh no. Cause the Patriots are just the most hate, hated. I know. So we're like, we're, it's like a tribe that's, you know, but what's funny is that I grew up when they sucked. So everyone's you have every right. To- yeah. I watched them lose for decades. My grandma, father died before you they paid. ever even you started winning paid, yeah and so when I, people I tell me that i'm just a, f- a fair weather fan i'm yeah. like no they Screw broke you. my heart for decades before they started before dominating yeah exactly yeah. no and I, I i jumped i mean so coincidental like around 2004 which is just about when i came to the u.s was when the Red Sox started winning, the mm-hmm. Patriots started winning, right? Yep. The curse was broken. Boston became a winning city. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I kind of got really lucky. I'm s- totally spoiled. That's amazing. So when, um, what'd you get your degree in? Quantitative computational biology. So I, uh-huh. I did I did those degrees because I was trained scientifically, you know, in Singapore, just high school and everything. I specialized in science. I really, really love the clarity of the scientific method. I find it so satisfying when you know, evidence can support a conclusion, Mm -hmm. um, which is why I also naturally have a bit of a resistance to grievance studies. Right, of course. There's no, it's not tethered to reality or any semblance of reality. (laughs) But uh, I I liked science, but that wasn't my real passion. The Mm -hmm. reason I studied, I took a STEM degree was because I wanted to get a job. And I wanted to get a job because I wanted to stay in America. Mm -hmm. Because I needed to get hired. Mm -hmm. And for a company to hire a foreigner, the company pays an extra, you know, like a couple thousand to the to the government, basically, because they have to justify why they're hiring a foreigner. Mm-hmm. And and in STEM degrees, that happens more often. So I knew I had to take a STEM degree for pragmatic reasons. I needed to get employed right. if I wanted to stay in the country. So I would have, had I been born an American, I would have actually probably done journalism. Mm, interesting. Um, I wanted to write. I wanted to be a, more of like a political scientist type. Okay. Uh, I was interested in that, but I didn't pursue it, you know, pr- like academically because of uh, considerations. For smart. Employment. Because yeah. you're smart. And so then did you get a job and in, in, what did you do right out of college? I worked at a research institute. Okay. So I was actually using my degree for a while. I was doing genome sequencing research and things like that 
fascinating. It, it, you know, I mean, the huge... Did you see that book right there? The first no, one. one. Oh, wait, Jean? Yeah. Oh, this is his new book. Yeah. It's great. He's a great writer. He's That's a great subject. writer. Yeah. We're talking about the book Gene, and it's the basically the history of the gene. By Sid Arthur. He, he wrote an amazing book called The Emperor of All Maladies, and it's about cancer. cancer. Yeah, that was his first one. Yeah, he's, I mean, brilliant. And just a, such an engaging, I'm not a STEM person at all. And, <laughs> and I love, I, it's still but a page be, turner. You can't be trained that way. I think you can always be trained. Like it's easier for a non-STEM person to learn the principles of, mm-hmm. rather than somebody who's kind of like a rigorous scientific logical thinker to be creative. You know what right, I mean? Right, right, right. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's much easier the other way. It's still challenging for me, but he writes books that are such such page turners, even for someone who, like myself, who's just not necessarily trained in science at all. So I literally have to Google like every other term and it's taken, it's, I haven't finished it. It's taking me a long time to get through, but it's so, it, it's just so fascinating. The, I could go on a 12 hour tangent about how fascinating genes are and how much influence they have and I everything. I was super, I was fascinated when I learned, I mean, I learned about genes from Richard Dawkins. I read The Selfish Gene. Mm-hmm. That blew my mind, mm-hmm. that book. It was like, I really like parsimonious frameworks like Oak, Oakham's Razor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and his explanation of how life could just begin this come every all the complexity that we see from just self replicating information carrying molecules was so satisfying to me that I when I decided okay you know what I have to pick a STEM degree why not physics well because the human genome was just sequenced in two thousand and four there was so many insights into it and I knew when your choice of study involves not textbooks because it's so frontier, right? Like nobody's written the textbook right. yet that you're reading papers, like all the graduates, st- like there's no yeah. program. So I, I, you know, that's the beauty of education in America. Like I could come in here and just like say, hey, there's this new field. The institution isn't prepared to train people in yet because it's that new. Yeah. But I want to pick and choose my majors to make up a degree that makes sense to work in this field in four years. Mm. You know, that's institutions like universities are so they're they're slow and cumbersome and they're not really flexible yet but liberal arts education generally allows you to pick and choose and mm-hmm. you know can justify that you can't do this in asia by the way right it's very rote it's very set you know everything is like kind of like um mapped out for you right um and i find that society in general and education system there's they're very unforgiving compared mm. to compared to here can you explain Oakham's razor so our listeners don't have to go google it oh <laughs> it's that the uh m- the simplest explanation is usually the likeliest one right um and it, it basically is is a statement on conditional probability mm-hmm. because every complex every everything that you kind of conjecture has probability attached to it. So the more conjectures you have, the probabilities multiply and it gets lower and lower and lower. And so the simplest answer is probably like, that's what, that's what a lot of people who are very anti conspiracy theories the, in general really like to bring up to justify, mm-hmm. you know, why that's they, like, is it like the sister of, or brother of um? what's the other one where it's j- don't attribute to, Something that can be Correct. explained by I stupidity. Harlan Hanlon. Hanlon's. Hanlon's razor. Hanlon's yeah. razor. And Christopher Hitchens brought it up once. Is the only reason why I uh, encountered it. It was something like, don't attribute to malice what could be attributed to either ignorance or stupidity. Right, right. I feel like that's very applicable in our society today. Every time there's a so and so is racist, look at. Hanlon's razor Mm -hmm. like bring that up is this just to like I think it was like H&M had a t-shirt that oh they had an ad where it was a young black kid was modeling a t-shirt that had a monkey on it oh I remember this and then obviously it was huge you know and it's just it's not malice no I think it's just stupidity right yeah or just ignorance or or someone like we were talking about this before we even started recording that I want to start this business because corporations celebrities all these people who aren't on the front lines of the culture war and don't understand theory uh, intersectional theory or any any theory they keep stepping in stuff like that you know somebody like you or i would have taken one look at that that before it went out and been like no 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 
this is a big red flag. You can't, you can't, you can't put this out in the world. I mean, I would hope that someone would. I mean, yes, at but- least make you, somebody aware of what they're going to be stepping in. I feel like you get the choice to do this. Yeah, but, but you would have to put on woke lenses to see. But this I because- think that we, I have that ability. I think I, I think I would have the ability to because I understand the theory, like those plates that just got canceled by Macy's, oh <laughs> the fat shaming ones or whatever. Yes. There were plates for our listeners who don't know. There were these Macy's plates and they had little different rings on the inside of them that went out, went outward. And the first one was skinny jeans. The second one was, um, what was the second one? It was like, nor- you know, Friday jeans or something normal. And then the, the, the outer ring was mom jeans. And it was like yeah. the apocalypse. And Macy's pulled, pulled them. It. I know. They and but I feel like any one of us who is possibly in this would have been able to say, "Hey Macy's, I let I see where you're going with this, but you pro- you're probably going to get some blowback." Just so you know, it's good advice. Then, but I wonder if by doing that, you know, we're preventing learning experience. Do you think anything good happened? Do you think anyone learned from that though? No, that we live in stupid times. Well, yes. yeah, okay. Yeah, I, because, okay, let's say... <laughs> I just start making billions of dollars actually censoring. <laughs> In the final irony, Bridget starts a business and censors everyone. <laughs> I'm like, I can prevent you from doing this by sanitizing the entire experience. <laughs> right, right. Wait, wait, which is why I love our common, our mutual friend Alice's products, the offensive crowd. Oh, yeah, so yeah. It's just... How would you advise her? Don't even put that out there. No, but see, I think that that's different because she's that's being a, intentionally contrarian. Okay. So it's one thing if you're being intentionally. That's your con- brand. That's your brand. And that's fine. But if you're Macy's and you're putting out a plate and there are all these people that just step in shit inadvertently and they could avoid it if they come talk to me. <laughs> for I my new needed. business I'm starting just consult me before you put any product out there and I will tell you whether or not you are going to get backlash <laughs> what's it going to be called like woke AF I was LLC? just going to call it 911 I'm being cancelled <laughs> <laughs> well there's the individual service right which that's actually, the 911 yeah. I'm being cancelled like what are the steps you know the mom's <laughs> coming after you this happened Your to my friend going recently. Viral. Yeah, so she didn't contact me before she made some apologies, which weren't the correct apologies. I could have avoided this as well. But the mob kind of came after her and I did a deep dive. So my first step is to evaluate the situation from all angles yeah. and see what everyone's saying. Watch the original, whatever, if it's tape, look at the original tweet, look at the the reaction, et cetera, or the YouTube video that somebody made and then come up with a strategy. I, I need to be the Olivia Pope of getting canceled. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, like a fixer. There's a niche. <laughs> and there yeah, is. There really is. We should start this business because you... No, you under- have very good instincts about... I See, I, I think I'm too hopeful. So if, <laughs> if I had been on that team in that room when Macy's was about to release the play, I would have been like, this is cute and probably really good for portion control. <laughs> um, <laughs> but see, yeah. I mean, I think as long as they know, because what what happens with these corporations is they step in it and panic, much like individuals who step in it and panic and then make it worse for themselves. So at least if you're consulting and you're saying we could just start a consulting agency and you're consulting and saying, okay, here's you saying this is cute. It encourages portion control. And then when I hear that red flag, I say, oh, no. No, right. no, no. It's fat phobic. <laughs> yeah, know. it's fat phobic. And there, you're going to get accused of fat shaming. So as long as you go into this aware and put it out with the awareness and then don't cave when everybody's I- encouraging you to and let it blow over for 72 hours because all of this stuff is like a flu. And if you ignore it, they'll exactly. just go away. Exactly. I always my joke is always what will Jay Z do? What would Jay Z do? I know I saw you tweet about that, but I don't understand it. Because when Jay Z and Beyonce 
ha- stepped in that shit. And these are as big as stars can get. Everyone Wait, knows who they, they are. What, what shit did they say? Remember when Solange went after Jay-Z in the elevator and then the tape got leaked and she was like beating Jay-Z up in the elevator and Beyonce was just what? standing next to him. It was this huge scandal because... Now people think it's because she knew that he was cheating on her, which they've all come clean with and lemonade, etc. So Jay-Z and Beyonce and Solange were in an elevator and the elevator, you know, the surveillance video right. got her just like attacking him and hitting him. And it came out and it was it went viral, obviously. And then everyone was talking about it and they were trying to figure out why and they all had their theories and they were waiting for a statement and they were demanding a statement and and Jay-Z and Beyonce did not say shit they just like let it blow over and never addressed it and it did it just blew over because they just never addressed it everything had nothing has if you have something that's lasting more than 72 hours in this news cycle you fucked up like what did you do Right. Even a, a mass shooting doesn't last you more ran, than 72 hours. You ran a hours. pedophile island, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That's and even that, even yeah. that just keeps kind of popping up, but no one really cares. I mean, Tim Dillon, the comedian, has been doing stuff. He's like, this is the biggest news story ever. And people are like, but they're, they're yelling about something stupid. Right. So I feel like, and then seeing these companies kind of panic and cave to this pop up mob, like, essentially. Thing, it, how big is this mob? Like, where did the yeah a couple of blue che- it's a couple it's like- of blue checks on Twitter and some celebrities usually right and they panic like their PR just panics and then they don't you but know the whole media ecosystem feeds that because you'll have you know you I I did this once where I actually tweeted an article it was published by the New York Post and I it was something like users find the latest iPhone sexist because it's so like they, oh yeah it's too they, big it was too big yeah so I remember this. hands. Sorry, I retweeted something like this. And then later on, I went to look at the article. And they basically, the source of this article was three tweets. Oh, this always happens. From one person yeah. that had two followers. Yeah. And I was like, why is this an article? And, and the reason why I really like the libertarians now, like people, the people, good writers at Reason, is that they're consistently tar- like writing and pushing back against this. Yeah, I see and that a lot. Robbie Soav has been writing articles about this shouldn't have been an article yeah so he has a whole series of articles about why this shouldn't be an article (laughs) yeah (laughs) covering yeah some they did something about this the other day where it said said something like this is the problem because it had this whole article and then it was like said one twitter user right right (laughs) it's ridiculous yeah it is and but it draws the clicks and i was guilty of that because i felt the outreach like who is calling the iphone sexist like look at this ridiculous yeah you know but then i when I investigate, I realize like I'm really trying to partake in outreach culture and amplify this signal over one tweet. Mm-hmm. No, so I deleted it. Well, because partially this is where I run astray as a comedian is that, and I walk that line that's very hard because sometimes I'll be serious. Like today, I think the lack of civility is something that I I can't I really stand. Agree. When people jump for today, the news cycle. Um, one of the Koch brothers died. Just that's the day we're recording. And everyone kind of is dancing on his grave and they all have their justifications, you, you know, dumb toxins, whatever their justification. But that to me is it's just weird. I can't believe that we live in a time where you put your name to a tweet celebrating someone's death. death. Yep. And somebody said in one of my in my mentions, this girl, Gretchen, who's hilarious, she said from an old tweet that I was talking about where I was raging against the same thing. She was saying these are from the same people who are coming after me for opening a bottle of champagne when we got Obama. So there's that's the thing is that there's no consistent application of the of the principles. And I think that's where people are feeling insane yeah. is that you're celebrating Coke's death. And then when somebody's like, yay, and- then they get mobbed because for doing the same thing. And people are, you know, people are, gen- they can't keep up with the rules. And and somehow he got care kitchen. The Koch brothers in general have been, I, I feel like their reputation publicly has become like a projection of what it actually really is. You know, we like, need boogeymen. I think that, exactly. you know, that's they're, exactly what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. Because they have put their names on research, research buildings at MIT mm. on arts, the art centers at, Lincoln Center in New York City. 
they've donated a lot of money to a lot of causes. And also a lot of people who are firmly on the left ignore the fact that the Koch brothers are actually for open immigration. Mm. So it's like everyone is just kind of like trying to see others as the archetypal enemy of yeah. who they're supposed to fight and they build them up to be that that way. And so when something like that happens, people react in kind. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's it leaves no room for nuance. And you, do you even dare to defend someone like the Koch brothers? Well, that's help? the thing. And then that, you're one of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's really no, it's like you either want to be a Nazi or you want to punch a Nazi. There's literally no in between but that's why i think you defend the ideals instead of the the idea of civility and I agree. and treating you know having the respect and consideration that this is someone's mother brother sister we do it with shootings we do it with just maybe taking that pause and saying okay before we jump to dancing on someone's right. grave, which is just not even really classy, why don't we consider that this is only making the it's only making everything worse? Just yeah. that kind of you know, Chloe Valdry has the her like theory it. of enchantment, and she's I love her courses, which I've been working my way through. And if anybody out there is interested in in these courses, they're so good. But the first principle is see people as humans and not a political abstraction. Right. And I think that our tendency now, because I've I've become a political abstraction. And then, like I was saying, the challenge as a comedian, and I was saying to Chloe online today, I always fail at principle number two, which is lift people use criticism only to lift up, not to tear down. Okay. And like empower. don't be snarky. But I'm I like I as a comedian, <laughs> there's just certain things that I, I can't I can't help but make fun of. So something like that article that you shared about the iPhone, I'll share it and make a joke of it. I know, I to, to because that. our culture is so stupid and it is a representation of but it's like three people. So I'm amplifying something that isn't isn't real because I think it's funny to mock I how mean, dumb our it, culture is. It, it's absurd. <laughs> and the fact that even one person thinks that way is absurd. <laughs> and it's, 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 it is fodder for comedy. Right. The only thing is, how do we prevent that from being represented as something that's a lot more common than it actually is? It's, it's, as long as somehow we can push back on that, that's fine to amplify that. Because at least one person thinks that, I think it should be mocked. Yeah. You know, like like comedians do that all the time with like, crazy what cults believe right it's true so i'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor i've had some experience in my life as the former playboy advisor and woman about the town gentlemen you need to do some grooming down there it is not only women who need to take care of their privates and make sure they're nice and trimmed and looking fabulous for their next viewing because you never know, and you want to be prepared. That's why this revolutionary company, Manscaped, has redesigned the electric trimmer. Their Lawnmower 2.0 has proprietary skin-safe technology, so this trimmer won't nick or snag your man's nuts. Men, listen up. Untrimmed pubes are a thing of the past. Cleanliness wins the way to my heart. The modern man manscapes in a hygienic way. Don't use the same trimmer on your face as you're using on your balls. That's disgusting. And let's talk about the stinky balls. Can we please? We all know how sweaty balls smell. And if you don't know how sweaty balls smell, I hope you never have to. That's why Manscaped also has the Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. Men, you already put deodorant on your armpits, hopefully. And if you don't, please start doing that. Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest parts of your body? And these products smell good. Their manly scent is attractive and will help set the mood, unlike that stanky smell, which immediately kind of does takes away from the mood. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. Ladies, this is the perfect gift for you and your man. And trust me, he will thank you. And men, your balls will thank you. And more importantly, your lady will thank you. So guys... Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code WALKIN. 
Well, my, I have a totally off topic question just because I thought of it when we were talking about jeans. What do you think of CRISPR? Oh my God. I So I worked. Can you first explain what CRISPR is? Because I butcher what it is when I try and explain it to people. And I, I think you will do a better job than well, me. CRISPR is a very specific um, gene editing technology. And it was actually invented. So the institute that I worked for was in the big patent fight um, with another uh, person at UC Berkeley, there was like a three-way intellectual property fight for for the patent rights to CRISPR because it was just kind of life-changing. Um, we're talking about the ability to excise portions of your genetic code and insert whatever you wanted in it. You could make a complete synthetic gene using you know some sort of like molecular system, scissors kind of system that we derive from bacteria. Mm. And so I was actually working at the time on a platform called the Infectious Disease Platform at the Broad Institute, which is the institute that where one of the claims for, for CRISPR's um, intellectual property came out of. And it it was scary tech because oh. this was the first time, we, we couldn't do this before. No, it's nuts. It, it was, it's very specific, it's very targeted. It's not just, you know, we always had restriction enzymes, which is like, you can chew up DNA. If, if the enzyme matched a certain code, you can just add it to to say like a, a sequence and it'll just like kind of cut it up. Mm -hmm. But this time we can actually like target, insert. we can actually target and insert yeah. whatever you want it to insert. And it, it really opened Pandora's box in terms of what we could use it for. And here's the thing, I always say, you know, whatever moral concerns we have, yeah, China does not have them. Right. And they will run and use it mm -hmm. and they have. So the kind of experiments that they are doing, we don't even dare to do. What kind of experiments, for example? Um, they're altering germline. So they're actually like, they are, have already, there have been reports that China has, or at least some scientists in China have, have attempted to, to make designer babies. Mm -hmm. I've um, heard about this. They're also doing very large scale What do you mean about designer babies? Oh, so they actually alter the germline. So, well, you know, when you have a child, it's just a random recombinant mix of, right. of mom and dad's DNA. And China, um, Chinese scientists have actually gone in to select selectively put in genes or change <laughs> genes. So you can be like, I want the blue eyes from mom Correct. and the no balding and the uh, and Correct. I want the smarts from from the mom in this department and the height from And and that is so controversial to even say the smarts because we're all like <laughs> now blank yeah. slatists, right? We're supposed to think that it's not inherited when when eighty percent there's, you know, eighty percent of your of your IQ is heritable right so that and that's controversial to say here because we're so concerned about egalitarianism right right we don't want to acknowledge the fact that there are co cognitive differences between people i mean isn't that why mozart was really good at music because his dad was a music isn't partially because he comes from a long line of musicians but they're also <laughs> yes but there's also amazing you know musicians that didn't right of course from. of course i'm not saying that I, i'm not de defending that you can't you know that all things are hereditary i just think that to act like that isn't something Correct. that's real that's is where we're at, equally though. as hurtful but th this is the issue we're, we're denying very basic biological basis of gender and china is altering germlines <laughs> like this is, this is the, with crispr you know yeah. this is the disparity and and why sometimes i i'm afraid about the future of of our countries so i have this recurring dream and i've had it for about 10 years and i'm in new york city and then some steam starts coming up from the manholes and then everybody drops it's people holes people holes <laughs> <laughs> yes because san francisco changed that now yeah so everybody falls down and we're all paralyzed and just looking at each other, but it's where I'm conscious. So it's basically like being in a K-hole. I don't know if you've ever tried ketamine, but it's essentially like we've been tranquilized, but not, but we can still function and somehow, and then it's the Chinese and they're occupying America. Oh my God. And, and it's all their armies. Sort of and when I saw all the video of the Chinese army uh, assembling outside of PLA. Hong Kong, yeah. I was like, this is the same shit with that was in my dream, like exactly the same tanks and everything. It was terrifying to me because I'm like, this, this was in my dream. Why? And then they're all marching, and somehow I get I get up, 
I manage to escape and I have to run through the woods of Connecticut and yep. all the way to my grandparents' house, which is in Rhode Island. My Your dream old, was geographically accurate. It was geographically accurate. Yeah. And I run all the way there and then I'm hiding there with my family where we've all assembled to try and defend ourselves against the Chinese <laughs> essentially and then I wake up every time when they cut when they get to the door it's I've had this dream probably like 20 times somehow in your subconscious you seem to be afraid of the gas it's like what are they pumping like it's like you're a natural libertarian <laughs> whatever's coming out from the manhole because it's always like hot steam or something yeah. it's this white plume right that comes up yeah what is that but one of these times it's gonna be something that's it's gonna be some that, gas, yeah, a chemical <laughs> or biological warfare yeah. Attack. So, anyways, that's my that's my big. No, I really appreciate your your tweets about uh, about China and uh, that one that I retweeted was something like you said, you know, in the streets of Hong Kong, people are actually fighting for freedom and democracy, and here it was the it was the weekend, it was the Antifa, Antifa versus <laughs> Proud Boys. Boys, and you just said Americans are larping, and I was like, that's exactly what it is. It's just like cosplaying idle minds with nothing better to do on the weekend it's so you know weird i'd rather you go shopping at the mall I i'm always know. like what kind of loser like that's just my instinct to all of them like what kind of loser partakes in any of this i know and it, it it's so funny to me because they're protected by the police in, in these circumstances Correct. <laughs> so no, the police they is what allows the event to, to even happen. do this yeah it's not like they're fighting the police or they're exactly they're 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 being basically refed by the police right. and it's so like how do you guys think this is badass you're basically coming out here and 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 fighting and the police are your refs this is right. like the most pathetic thing i've ever seen no and in part i because I wanted to be more effect, like, you know, um, I wanted to, to sort of practice a bit more effective tweeting, like in the sense of like, what issues really are the most consequential, I should spend more time on them. And so for the same reason, I, I spent more time sort of like talking, tweeting about China, Hong Kong, because it's just on the, in the grand scheme of things on this global scale, when you zoom out of just American culture wars, mm -hmm. this issue is going to be a defining one for our time it's for so our generation struggle I, it must be strange to come from singapore and be in america and see what's going on in hong kong and then juxtapose to what is happening in america yeah what what do you feel what does that stir in you <laughs> i mean you know there i don't really like the argument that we can't be concerned because some 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 people make make this argument i don't really like the argument that we can't be concerned about feminist rights you know like say like uh the me too scandal whatever because some people in iran can't even take off their hijabs without right. being jailed i think we can be concerned about several things but i think proportionality should be encouraged i agree right so i it's crazy to me to to to, to get all worked up because thermostats are apparently sexist right that is ridiculous right completely ridiculous and and literally the first world definite problem right mm -hmm. you actually have thermostats mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly the temperature um for starters like the the privilege of somebody just you know blathering about such a problem a i say this all the problem. time on here that i think america's biggest problem is that i'm convinced that everyone and I don't know if people know, I wonder how much of the general public even knows about Antifa and the Proud Boys fighting. I don't know if Actually, the, I don't, yeah. I don't know if the mainstream covers it. I don't know if, but if um, you're on Twitter, you will, if you're on Twitter, you do. And, but I don't know, we kind of live in that culture. So I don't want to alienate any of my listeners who don't know if that's, you know what that even is. And it's like these two extreme little factions. I think Andy's, attack by antifa made made the mainstream made, made the mainstream right everyone covered even cnn did but i think i always joke that i think it's pretty clear that no one who's a member of antifa or the proud boys has a passport and if they do they haven't used it i agree with that <laughs> like, but and also, i think a lot of our problems in america and things that we complain about stem from people just not traveling around the world enough actually and that's actually kind of related to how i felt when i met Faisal, my, my co-founder. Okay. In his case, like, I mean, I had my concerns and my complaints growing up in Singapore, but by and large, it's a very prosperous, stable country. In very many clean. Regards, far more safe than living in America. Mm -hmm. And so I meet Faisal and all these concerns I've had, I'm like, you know, yeah, sure, no freedom of the press, sure, no freedom of speech. 
yeah, Al Qaeda shooting up my neighborhood and my brother died and and you know his best friend was killed because they thought it was him and he had been fighting he'd been like blogging and talking about um the problems of extremism for a long time wow and so you know my consequence of speech i already knew the, the you know what i couldn't say but if i did say it i would probably just get investigated and jailed <laughs> they will get killed right so it was one of those things when i met him it was like okay maybe maybe these problems are not that bad right you know the ones that i thought was like my world and like oh my oppression or whatever it was <laughs> um and that that's the kind of thing that meeting people from other parts of the world and, and paying attention to these stories like what's happening in hong kong what's happening in moscow with the pro-democracy protests mm-hmm. and then in the same breath you have some people here calling say trump a dictator right mm-hmm. all right you can argue that maybe there are some things that he has done and said that has some authoritarian tendencies but to equate and to use the same language to to, to put all these problems in the same basket as if Trump is dictator for life, Xi Jinping, mm-hmm. that is irresponsible. Mm-hmm. And it's it actually does trivialize the fight that the Hong Kong people are, are you know, taking to the streets. Yeah. Um, so it gives you this sense of perspective. All these social justice woke stuff that we hear about, if they zoomed out, mm-hmm. if they zoomed out and looked at the world in, you know, not just not just globally as a big, bigger picture, but also just time, right? Because that was why I wrote that article about, about um, post-colonial theory. Right. Because people were assailing the um, Hong Kong protesters for waving the British flag, for waving the American flag, singing the, the, the Star Spangled Banner. Um, they saw that as, you know, they were pining for some colonial, their colonial masters. Right. And Internalized so they, colonialism. Exactly. So they were they were trying to use that as a way to say like, no, no, we should definitely support the side of the, you know, the, the Chinese. Right. So Which you're is actually insane. supporting fascism. And a- authoritarian. Because you don't like colonialism and you think that's what they're doing. Wow. Well, no, how about these are just symbols, symbols of principles that, they see associated with the West, right? Right. Whether it's freedom of speech, which is what they they also want the due process because right. they didn't like this idea of this extradition law mm-hmm. that the Chinese government could basically just legally, when this law passes, just extract anybody they wanted, and it could be just a political dissident, right? It just could be somebody they didn't like mm-hmm. what he was saying, mm-hmm. not just somebody that committed a crime. Prosecute them, just bring them over the border, and and it is basically like a legal kidnap right disappear them right and so this happens all the time due process Mm -hmm. due process these are institutions that came out of the west first Mm -hmm. right and but ideas have to be malleable they have to they have to be able to you know it's not appropriation to to take good ideas from another one and it's very that's why these ideas are very dangerous Mm -hmm. and i wrote that article because i saw a lot of arguments from from the left about how people would be like they would say things like, oh, look at the protesters, just, you know, upholding the flag of colonialism. This is a shame. This is a tar on, on all of them. I'm like, no, what they're fighting for is the ideas, the ideals of democracy. Right. Very, very much what America was founded on, you know, the Constitution, the French Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment. These were, we were all beneficiaries of, of these ideas that set forth, you know, the progress that Stephen Pinker writes about in Enlightenment now. Mm-hmm. And yes, I think it's still true that today we are living in the best time possible. Mm-hmm. Lo- you know, we're, we're living longer. Our quality of life is just getting better. There's still less violence than there has ever been in any period of time. Increasingly so, despite, you know, <laughs> stupid Proud Boys and, mm-hmm. and, and little Antifa skirmishes. Mm-hmm. Even mass shootings, right? Look at the numbers. Yep. We're, we're not any more violent. And, and all of this is just throwing that out. Yeah. Uh, distorting that perspective. So tell me about, you mentioned Faisal and your, co, your co-founder. Yeah. What, tell us about your business. So we started an organization called Ideas Beyond Borders, mm-hmm. basically to take ideas that are not represented um, in Arabic, Farsi, and Kurdish, languages that are widely spoken in the Middle East, but we really focus on Arabic because it is the fifth most spoken language in the world, but represents only less than 1% of the global online content. Wow. So if you look at Wikipedia, you know, whatever you and I can access on Wikipedia in English, blot out 90% of that. Wow. That's all you can get in Arabic. Wow. So if I always say like, if the word feminism or if the word um, Orwellian doesn't exist, 
as a page that you can just look up, does the concept exist right. in your mind? Right. right. So if you can't access something like that. And so we we set up the organization to to put out these kinds of ideas that are lacking narratives that that we think can challenge extremism before it even takes root. You try to de-radicalize a person that already firmly believes that the other needs to be killed and taken care of, it's too late. They already believe you're the enemy. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about inoculating people from a much, much younger age. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what we try to do with education. So, you know, science, philosophy, content like that, modern books, pop science books, we translate them to Arabic and basically build a library and make them freely available. So basically you have no excuse. Yeah. You know, we, in America, if you're ignorant, it's a choice. Yeah. In other parts of the world, it's because it's not available. Right. You don't have a choice to not be ignorant. Your government censoring things, your culture and religion censoring things. You can't even learn because you're a girl. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But if we put that out there and at least make it accessible, yeah. then there's a chance. There's a chance they stumble upon it. It's it's bottom up. The reason why we can't do anything top down is because in, in authoritarian countries, those people have already been brainwashed to right. distrust you. Right. You know, all their, the leaders, the thought leaders that they follow, they have been speaking ill of the West mm-hmm. for a long time. They think anything that comes from there is, is corrupting. Mm-hmm. That's the narrative. Actually, that's used in China as well, mm-hmm. which is why when the protesters started waving the US and, and UK flag, they said, oh, this is proof. The Chinese state media said this is proof that the CIA. I has, saw this. It's you know, a conspiracy in exactly. the mainland. Yep. And it spread so easily because really that's the only narrative they have. They have one media and mm-hmm. it's just state linked. So these are the kind of forces that we're fighting against. And that's why it drives me so mad to read about Macy's canceling plates because they're fat phobic. Right. It's like if we all spent our energies on these things that have far, far greater impact and greater mm. consequence. I mean, China is gaining power politically in the world oh, yeah. at a rate that should be should scare most people, mm. but does not. Mm-hmm. And I dread to see the day where they are big enough of a global power to to really, really call the shots, mm-hmm. to mold other countries in their likeness, mm-hmm. which is a surveillance, Social techno currency. dystopia. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, do we want that world? No. no, and we should be doing everything to push back against that mm, it's, and, and it's the same thing with extremism like Faisal always says that polarization is the mother of extremism right when you have a highly you know polarized like the article in the article that you wrote about people kind of existing at extremes and the centrists in the middle are getting exhausted and either they're being they're tuning out they're getting or they're they're just disengaging mm-hmm. or they're joining the extremes right right it's really what two choices i think you, you had three though well i can't remember the third one go in insane i'll go, <laughs> <I'll> go <laughs> insane, which is worse probably the worst but i said i think everyone's going insane no no matter what you choose i think everyone's going cra- a bit crazy right or at least they f- yeah they feel that way enough to want to take a right that's why mm. social media detoxes are getting so uh popular so popular mm. But that environment creates it's it's basically fertile ground for for you know to to sort of go through this process of reciprocal extremism. One side inflames the other, the other side now inflame inflates the other, and all these articles that we're talking about that three based on three people's right Twitter eggs tweeting is making the situation worse. Right, it is, it and is. it's strangely it's it's kind of. It's kind of all connected. I know it's it, it's. I wrote that article um, about the politically homeless, the battle cry, and I loved it. I've heard from a couple of people who come from like the Soviet Union, er, former Soviet Union, or Russia, or parts of Eastern Europe, and Correct. they said, and they've written me and said, you know, what you describe about the siloing of the private and the public is what happens in communism. Yep, and they were explaining to me that that description, specifically saying people are siloing their public and their private personas, is very indicative of what happens when you're under a communist state. It's not. I mean, actually, Faisal grew up under Saddam Hussein, and he described to me what it was like that, you know, his father would have Saddam's picture ready, and when even his best friend came over to the house, he would hang Saddam's picture because he mm. couldn't even trust that his best friend would not tell on him. Right. Imagine living like this. Yeah. You know, constantly afraid. You can't even trust your best friend. Yeah. And in your own home. To to not report on you. I know. To, and, and it's again, this is wrong think, right? It's just 
wrong think is such a crime and and thinking Saddam is a bad guy is the wrong thing there. Mm -hmm. So what, how is the business going? It's going well. We're about one and a half years since we got our 501c3. Wow. um, Which is the IRS, you know, tax-free declaration. Nonprofits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we've done, I think we've had now about six or seven books fully translated. Wow. Um, Do you speak Arabic? I I don't. I've been trying to learn. So Duolingo just started in Arabic. uh, free what languages you know, do you speak mandarin english and because of a couple french boyfriends i can understand french and okay basically pass a little bit off mm-hmm. speaking but my accent's terrible because i can't do this you just I reminded me of this thing. old joke i used to start he- oh yeah the <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. do that very well i just heard i re- i feel like i remember around 9 11 <laughs> around that time in the early 2000s, there was some joke that someone told me that the optimists are learning Mandarin and the pessimists are learning Arabic. Oh, my God. <laughs> I feel like that's maybe funny. it's I, I don't know if that's like a, true anymore, but that you was, would get immediately hired by the CIA if you, you know, a lot of. or Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> state governments who want to want to hire you if you spoke Arabic. It's a very useful skill. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. I love I love that language. But you know what? You know, you don't have to do it for Mandarin because at least I mean. Most people, even from China, would speak English. Right. So it's actually, you don't have to learn Mandarin. They'll, they'll come to you. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. The Spectator magazine is launching in America. For those of you that don't know The Spectator, it's the longest running magazine in the English language, having been published in the UK for 191 years. And now it's getting ready to launch its US edition it's already out. We have our, I have my first one here already. Launching in print starting in October and being delivered monthly. The U.S. edition follows much the same path as the U.K. magazine, delivering fearless, beautifully written, and impeccably sourced journalism. If you sign up now, you'll get your first issue free. Just go to spectator.us slash subscribe and use offer code walk in i love the spectator because i write for them (laughs) i'm a columnist there but i really like writing for them and the reason that i'm supporting this u.s endeavor is because they're so sassy one of their their whole thing is they let me write satire no one ever lets me write satire it doesn't take itself too seriously it's fun and fun and a funny read If you want a dose of British humor injected into American politics, this is for you. The Spectator is a respected journal of opinion on politics and economics that also produces high quality journalism on the arts, culture, and lifestyle. We don't fall into a boring, politically rigid category of left or right, which is also why I love it. It first and foremost challenges, informs, and entertains its readers. Listeners can get their first issue free by going to spectator.us slash subscribe and use offer code WALKIN. So get your first issue free today. You can read my column about sex robots this month. Go to spectator.us, subscribe, and use the offer code WALKIN to start your free trial today. So... What are we talk about like grit and resilience? And I feel like this is the underpinning of most of the conversation that we're having. Do mm-hmm. you, but personally, what are kind of some of the, what was your dark night of the soul? What What is your kind of hardest moment that you've had to overcome? I guess I would say, okay, so I've, I've been pretty privileged my whole life, like upper middle class. You know, my, my father worked for the Singapore government actually. <laughs> so we were, part of that political privileged mm-hmm. class. And I, I, I really hesitate to to talk about, I mean, that that perspective I shared with you about how when I first met Faze, I was like, okay, all that thing that I thought was trauma, it's not. Right. Snap out of it. Um, and also because I grew up in one of the most, just honestly, I would if I had to choose where to raise a kid, Singapore is just so good and stable that I even hesitate to do that because I don't want to raise snowflakes. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So... In terms of, it's I mean, I would, so I would describe in terms of like trauma, the only kind of trauma I've ever experienced in my life is are the times when my entire worldview was rearranged. Right. When like everything that you thought was true turns out to not be. Mm-hmm. Or the world that you see, it just suddenly deals you this blow, right? Mm-hmm. And I was raised very, um, my mom was evangelical Christian. Ah. So the day that I kind of realized in my own head that like this, 
was a charade and everything that I was indoctrinated to believe was not true Mm -hmm. was, I mean, I don't think anybody, if you've gone through that process of either deconverting or even the other way converting, Mm -hmm. you will remember that day that that your whole worldview just switched. (laughs) It's like when you find God or when you lose him. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Or no, it's, it's just, or they always say like, you know, the day you grew up was the day, the first time you realize your parents told you a lie. Right. Right, that was that awareness, that shit. Like this was how that was my epistemology. It was a parent-induced, you know, epistemology. I call it factory settings. That's it's okay. like That's what really was good. squeezed into your brain before you had a choice. Right. No, and ex- exactly why we started this digital free Arabic library. It was mm-hmm. to it was to really challenge this factory the, settings. Mm-hmm. Actually, I should use that that phrase Take way it. more often. Run it. Um, <laughs> And, and and those settings are strong in that part of the world because mm. of different layers of indoctrination. We're not just talking about your family. You know, I lived in a place where at least it was just my mom. But I would say the hardest time was dealing with, and, and I think it's still relevant today. It's like, okay, what happens when, okay, you don't believe the same things. My mom obviously believes in, you know, the Lord. She's a pract- very evangelical practicing Methodist. Um, and she could not deal with the fact that my sister was gay. Mm. And I was sick and tired of her never, I really believe we only have one life. There's no other chance. So I wanted her to have the relationship with her daughter that, you know, I think she should have. And it would be such a pity for my sister to never have that close relationship with my mom. Right. But she wouldn't accept the fact that she was gay and she only wanted to be with girls. And so the hardest thing I'd ever done was I disowned myself from the family. Wow. I told her that if she wouldn't accept my sister, that she would lose her only other daughter. Wow. And it was just the two of us. So I walked away and it was, you know, thankfully it didn't last that long. Uh Uh-huh. But those few weeks of just, you know, not knowing, basically just imploding the whole family structure. Right. And using my relationship with her as a hostage to get her to accept my sister um that was probably the most difficult time that's ever. extremely difficult did, yeah. did they have a relationship now that they finally do wow yeah. and but, you and but your mom do? had to you know in her mind like she really thought she really and she probably still does think that she's going to hell like that's just well that's what i mean it's it's so hard because you know you talk about losing your whole worldview when it gets turned upside down but that she did too right my exactly on the other side like, exactly for her like she had to confront with that part which is why also i found the conversation between ben shapiro and dave about the whether or not he would attend his gay wedding mm-hmm. to be interesting mm-hmm. because it's it's very similar forces here mm-hmm. at the end of the day i don't think me or my sister would ever doubt that my mother loved us mm-hmm she's super religious and and, and whatever she, we ultimately feel that she's trying to you know like curtail our way of life curtail our freedoms because of her pre-assumption her pre- set of assumptions she's doing it out of love and you can you can see the direct line right she's so worried it's difficult to and i think that's what's missing in today's lack of civility it's that we we do not see the line between their good intentions mm-hmm. and their actions, which right. we disagree with ultimately. Because, you know, I obviously think that well, gay people should be able to love whoever they want. Right. But in somebody who is a conservative, a religious conservative's mind, that's not what they think. They mm-hmm. think that I'm saving you from hell. Mm-hmm. And that's coming from a place of love. And mm-hmm. to understand that, that's difficult. Right. You know? It is difficult. Wow, that's I'm you walk the walk. I mean, that is definitely Yeah, it's hard to do that also to somebody that you love. Like yeah. To, you know, I, I my heart broke when I Yeah, of course I disowned my own mother. Yeah, yeah. I've I've been in a similar I know what that is yeah. like. There's like no greater bond and when that bond is broken or distorted or yeah. violated it somehow it's so it's like i think it definitely does a number on your head that I, is hard I, to explain i think the capacity to love somebody also gives you the same capacity to hate the person the most mm. it's like kind of a two-way street mm-hmm. you mm. can't really you can't really be that angry at somebody you don't really care about or love right which is why every twitter egg that says you know you're whore i don't care like, right it's just, i don't care about your opinion so what are you? What are the challenges you're confronting now? We're, we're I feel like we are in occupy similar space in the culture war, I guess, in terms of just being 
being in that place of like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of think of people daring to think publicly. With, yeah, with no, you know, with little what are some of the? I know you were mentioning that there was a one of the events you were going to speak at has been caught up a bit in this uh, cancel culture yeah. of having things, you know, people's ideas being shut down because they aren't are disagreeable or un unmentionables or whatever we call them now or yeah. what is it a, what are they called in deplorables no well That's they're terrible. here they're called deplorables but you know and it's almost like a it's almost becoming like in india how they have the oh untouchables yeah, untouchables yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the caste system the yeah. caste system yeah, yeah i feel like that's what's yeah. there's a bit of that in, in in beginning to seep into our culture and the more things are political the more topics will be untouchable. Mm. And so what's left for us to talk about is becoming increasingly, you know, small. So like, I'm even concerned about even the state of sports. Because yeah. sports now has become political, Kaepernick, you know, like all these things. And what used to be like a nice refuge away from politics, it was just the one thing that we broke down. Like at the end of the day, like, the sports tribalism is healthy tribalism, right? right? Like it's, it's a good expression of it. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's in, in fact within the Patriots, you'll find Black Patriots supporters and everyone. Actually, funny story about that. I remember being in a bar. Um, we were watching the the playoff games, and one of the uh, the Patriots players scores, and his name was White. And the black guy, his last name was White. A uh, black guy in the bar starts shouting, "White, White, White Power." <laughs> And the whole bar just fell silent. Like nobody <laughs> wanted to go along. It was like one of those like, they're like it's a trap. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a trap. <laughs> but I always remember that. But you know, that's that's healthy tribalism, right? Yeah. This is like, it's not based on these immutable characteristics. It's a tribe we elect to be part of. I got, I got a lot of criticism about the piece. The The criticism that came from the, the left is that basically it is my privilege that allows me to be disinterested. I, get, I hear it. I get that pushback all the time because, you know, I, I have publicly identified identified as a centrist. Mm -hmm. And the reason I do that is because I see no benefit right now to aligning myself with either party. Also, I think it, it leads you to price party over Yeah, principle. people hate that word centrist. I've just, I try to use independent because centrist has, uh, people have the idea that just because you're centrist, you're both sides in everything. Exactly. And or it's or the that you're wrong, always taking the middle position. Right, or you're like, trying to find the balance between something abhorrent and something that isn't. No, it just means that you're evaluating things on a case-by-case -case basis correct. and not identifying them preemptively based on what you are supposed to believe about a situation because of the tribe you're aligned with. Exactly. And I, people misunderstand that, I think, a lot, which is why I, I generally I, go with independent. I want to take back the word because it's like it's like the word racism now. People have redefined racism to be prejudice plus power, not just prejudice. Right. And I don't like the fact that they're that they're able to do that. And in the same way with the word centrist, because what they really think centrism is, is moder being a moderate, which is really this middle of the well, way. Okay, <laughs> that's that's moderate. To be a moderate is, is to always like, okay, between... Looking for compromise. Guns, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even when there is none. Right. Um, versus the centrist who could take extreme left, extreme right positions on different issues. Right. And it's just that they're not, you know, there's no reason why we have... Uh, somebody that if i know that you are a huge second amendment person i pretty much know your position on markets on uh free speech on a, a whole host of yep. other things right because abortion we know how it clusters yeah yep. that's what i'm talking about it's this clustering effect mm -hmm. it should not exist mm -hmm. if everyone mm -hmm. was truly independent thinkers centrists mm -hmm. in other words like mm -hmm. that you should be able to find a pro-life anti-gun person I had a one. I've had so many interesting emails from people, and one woman said, "Why can't I just have somebody who will let me have my guns and keep their hands off my uterus and wants small government?" And I was like, "You never hear that, you know? That's exactly. and this is somebody from Missouri or something." So it's it's funny when you start hearing, particularly from women who are pro-choice and pro-gun yeah. and yeah. those I, two I things love, don't exist. But I love amplifying these people right. because it's so important to break that party line. Right. So when like someone like Tommy Lauren came out saying she's pro-choice, I was like, 
this is huge and this is important to amplify her. You can be conservative, you can also be pro-choice. You know, it's it's important to hold those two things as possibilities. I love, um, I can't remember his name, Benji, I can't remember his last name, but he is super young, 21 or 22, and he's he started a whole organization about um, conservatives and the environment and conserving because he's tired of the idea that young conservatives don't care about the environment. And so he's trying to break that narrative that conservatives don't give a shit about yeah. about climate change or the the globe. I love narrative breakers. I love mm-hmm. stereotype breakers. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the same way with like I love people who just say, you know, I don't. I mean, in part, even though I don't agree with a lot of what Candace Owens says, I know why what she's doing is important mm-hmm. to say. Okay, if you're black, you don't have to vote Democrat. Mm-hmm. You don't have to. Yeah, that's all she's trying to push back against, and and ideas like that are are important. And they're powerful. Yeah. I mean, it liberates people to to say, okay, maybe I don't have to check every single box Correct. to to just go along with what's okay and right. follow the fall into fall into line. Yeah, yeah. But one of the things I kept hearing often, I, um, a million times that day when the article went out, was that um, Martin Luther King had a lot to say about white moderates. It's like his famous quote from the Birmingham jail letter, Mm -hmm. letter from a Birmingham jail. And he, it's just, uh, it. first of all, to assume that everyone writing me is white is crazy because they're not. They're from all over the world. And I've had, I've had emails from people in Slovakia and Indian who emigrated here. Somebody who is in, I mean, people from all over the world are resonating with this because you're seeing that this populism and the division happening globally right and so people are feeling this way and all kinds of that was really the most surprising thing that happened when the piece went out was people saying oh hey from germany hey from all over the world yeah and um so to assume that this is just a american that this is happening and b and i i wrote to america because i'm american but B, to assume that it's only uh, like I've heard from Latins who are conservative and it's the wrong assumption to make. And so right there saying something like that, it's that whole idea, which I address in the piece of carrying water for Nazis or. And again, I try to have that open mindedness, the same thing. If you really believe all of the things Trump is Hitler, we're descending into fascism this is coming all of these things i understand why you're pushing back and saying that i'm the equivalent of a quote unquote good german well that's actually why so that argument that you're carrying water for hitler was why the event was you know threatened um it's it was it's it was billed as a free speech event um the official title was ending racism violence and authoritarianism Mm -hmm. and it was sponsored by minds.com which is a um a social media it's a it's a facebook competitor but it's based on blockchain and some other tech that's kind of different than Mm -hmm. facebook but it's it's quite explicitly a facebook competitor they're trying to be a social media company that doesn't have the same ambiguity when it comes to you know community standards Mm -hmm. and censorship Mm -hmm. so so obviously they would put out a free speech event and invite public thinkers, YouTubers, journalists. Untouchables. Untouchables, some of them. But And and they are actually pretty even. So, you know, we have people coming from um, Elwood, who's a, Graham Elwood, who's with the Young Turks. Mm-hmm. And then you have Sargon of Akkad, who mm-hmm. is running for UKIP, I think, in the, in the right-wing party of the UK. But oh, wow. He's, a, he's the one who got kicked off Patreon, right? Correct. And it caused all of this. Correct. Okay. He got Patreon for something for something he said on YouTube. <laughs> That's the beauty. Of the, right, of I that saw incident. that. It, it was, was ridiculous. The most terrifying part of that entire kerfuffle was that it was the credit card companies Correct. pressuring Mastercard, yeah. Mastercard pressuring Patreon to essentially deplatform him for something he said on another on platform. YouTube, not even a Nazi. Not so, even on yeah. Patreon. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was when I was like, okay, <laughs> right, this is terrifying. And so, and Tif, um, and I think the one of the biggest um, targets with the person with the targets on his back is actually Andy No. Mm-hmm. Um, this event was successfully deplatformed. Uh, was originally supposed to be held in Pittman, New Jersey, at the Broadway Theater, and with enough, you know, threats, uh, they even hacked the official venues 
Twitter account. And mm-hmm. they said, we won't give it to you back until you cancel it. There were threats to burn the theater down. The organizers are really close friends of mine. And they had done similar events before <laughs> in Milwaukee. It's crazy. Stop One- hosting terrorists or we're going to burn your building exactly. down. Like, what? Do you, how do you not, I don't understand. And before, so last year when we did, when, when I was at the, at the other event that they did last year, there was a bomb threat called in. So, wow. so in the middle of the, of the event, about 5 PM, we all had to evacuate the theater. Obviously if it's, the police will never know if it's credible or not. And, and if you're doing your job right, which they were, you know, they had to evacuate yeah. and just investigate the claim. And this is the issue with, I think Wesley, you know, Wesley Yang, he's really kind of he's a writer with the new yorker he he's written tweets and 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 actually one or two articles about this about the asymmetry of power here Mm -hmm. these are guerrilla tactics Mm -hmm. you have nothing to lose and a lot of time on your hands you can create a lot of chaos for for people that have a lot to lose Mm -hmm. and because of the way threats have to be investigated you can cause so much disruption and ramp up security costs to the point that it makes having an event untenable right so when ben shapiro spoke at uc berkeley Mm -hmm. his security costs to uc berkeley was six hundred thousand dollars just to have that event because Mm -hmm. of the threats Mm -hmm. right now you ask yourself six hundred thousand dollars is that worth an event right so i you know i'd love to hear him speak but this is a cost and who is footing the bill and it's less about and then you can say oh it's not about free speech it's about budget you know right, and so exactly. they it puts them in a position where even at a public school they say well it's a budgetary concern it has nothing to do with the free speech right. so it's this weird loophole in the system and so the venue caved. Mm-hmm. The Broadway theater said, okay, we can't do the event anymore. These threats are just overwhelming. And so I think, and I can't really blame businesses sometimes. Can't. And I can't blame individuals yeah. when individuals get mobbed into taking down tweets or exactly. whatever. I don't blame people when they're, when they have a business and they're trying to do whatever or they have to do. Or yeah. families to provide for you. Yeah. You can't. And, you know, I think, they're looking for another to another venue to, to pick it up. Tim Pool's helping. He did a really mm-hmm. good video he's about this. YouTuber. He's also speaking okay. at the conference. Again, he's another one that has been accused of being a right wing hack, especially of, of late. Yeah. And um, one of the targets of the conference. So what do you what is your pushback to that argument of carrying water for Nazis or Hitler? Well, or- I got that. So when I posted about the event, I was encouraging people to, to still attend it. You know, we're not going to cave to the mob. Um, these terrible tactics. Someone had written like, "I'm going to reconsider my support of your organization because Oof. you are willing to, you know, I'm moderating a panel with and Sargon's on it." Uh-huh. And I pushed back. I said, "Well, why didn't you say anything about the people on the left? Why are you only tarring me for basically sharing a stage? Nothing more. Mm-hmm. You don't even know the content of what I'm going to say. I, mm-hmm. I might disagree with Sargon with." Carl Benjamin, mm-hmm. Sargon of Akkad, I might push back on him. This hasn't happened, and you're already judging trying it. to tar it with right. guilt by association. Right. And now you're saying this is an alt right event because, alt light event because of the presence of certain individuals you disagree with. Right. How come it never gets painted the other way? Why is it never a left event because there are two, there are like three, you know, far left progressives there? Mm-hmm. It's always one sided. Mm-hmm. And then when, when one side refuses because they're more, you know, they subscribe more to intellectual purity, right? So in one side refuses to share a stage, it's going to be, it's like your problem too. Mm-hmm. It's like harder to get on uh, media that, that leans left. It's harder to get on events where it's a bit more balanced because one side won't work with the other side. Right. And, and that is another asymmetry that we have to deal with. So it's, it's like, okay, we want to have these public conversations. We're, we're, the pretext of this entire event was to deal with polarization. Was right. To talk about how to, you know, this is the <laughs> It's such irony. a trap. It, it is. It's such a trap. It's say, it's like saying you only appear on right-wing media and then not inviting you on the meet and then not exactly. having you on or not sharing a stage with you. Exactly. So it's like this it's like you can't Damn if you do. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can't, can't get out of it. Yeah. It's they've trapped you basically. Right. Exactly like you said. Yeah. So it has been eye-opening on the heels of this piece and what you're dealing with with this with this event because I, the pushback I got from the right is, do you actually think what's happening on the right is at in terms of freedom of thought as bad as it is coming from the left? 
And I have to say, just given the fact that I've been asked to speak on multiple right wing and they want to know how they're pushing voters away. What do I see? How do I feel about them? What are my they're open they're to curious. a discussion and they're yeah. curious and not one left wing organization. And I'm getting more emails from left wing people who are abandoning the party and turning independent than I am right wing. Hmm. And so I have to say that just the reaction to the piece from the left set speaks volumes. It's very important right now for the left to stand up for free speech. It is. So when we we have like a, we do a lot of events on campuses as well, um, Ideas Beyond Borders, and when we did one at Harvard, it was billed as a free speech event. Mm -hmm. We were told, oh, you have to change the title because free speech is now seen as the domain of the right. Ugh. And you can't have that in, a, in your title. The student, that, the student union would not approve the event. That is terrifying. Because it's a dog whistle now to- That is right. terrifying. And that terrifies me. Know, it does. It I does. just got chills. And that's, that's terrifying. That's actually why, you know, even though I really ideologically disagree with Glenn Greenwald, he at least is upholding this free speech, you know, is mm -hmm. an absolute, we have to uphold it. We cannot, we cannot pay, you know, it, you don't know what's going to happen. You may not like what the person's going to say, but when those, you know, when those mores are in place, they'll, they'll come after you. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just shifting political sands. Oh, God, that just gave me deep, deep, terrifying chills to my soul. Yeah. And I would say that one of the challenges is that at the end of the day, we, we're about open access, right? It's like all ideas should be accessible, not just the 10 percent that's available, not just whatever your government and media is trying to tell you. But here are other books perspectives. And for that, sometimes you will get accused of colonialism like mindset cultural colonialism or something like you know by talking about western philosophy western science mm -hmm. and i hate putting the term western in front of any of these because mm -hmm. these are supposed to be universal ideas mm -hmm. they originated from some thinkers in the west mm -hmm. but by no means have the west put an uh, you know like a little line around it and said this is mine. ours like yeah. this is for everyone. everyone yeah but then when you do that you get accused of colonialism mm. of like some sort of intellectual you know like hijacking mm. of the mind mm -hmm. um corruption and that's one of the that's one of the you know criticisms that we do see it's like mm -hmm. it's bad enough we're trying to fight the forces on the ground in these places that mm -hmm. are authoritarian and extremist in mm -hmm. nature it's even worse that we have to counter the PR from our side of the pond. Right. So it's like, can we at least, do you know what this, do you know how high the stakes are here? Like, yeah. Why are yeah. you fomenting the exact, parroting the exact same lines that authoritarians in power are parroting? Oh, uh, gosh. That's what infuriates me the most about dealing with stuff back here. So what do we do? What do you think we do? Just keep doing what the we're- The people that can, like- you and to some extent me, but mm -hmm. not as much as you, are able to keep pointing this out. Mm -hmm. This exa exactly what you were talking about with this exhausted majority, hidden tribe. The people we, we have to like encourage people to not tune out. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. They gotta be they gotta be aware. But then on the other hand, I, I'm not sure because maybe too many people tune into politics is what's making the polarization problem. Well, they worse. did do that study that the more you're paying attention, the more tribal you actually are right and if you think you're viewing the other side it's actually only radicalizing yourself radicalizing essentially yes by yeah. even paying attention to the other side so there's yeah, a I'm not sure there's a question of yeah we don't i don't know how powerful the algorithms are working in our favor because most of them are working to divide us i think just because algorithmically it is better for these platforms to have yep. that kind of engagement incentives right mm -hmm. like the way their incentive structures mm -hmm. are set up yeah it is to encourage more eyeballs and, mm -hmm. more, no and clickbait one, no one is going to get big parody you know like walk in the middle and, and being nuanced and and <laughs> no one there's a new movie coming out and the trailer dropped today and there's this guy and he said no one wears a t-shirt that says i love nuance and i was like i need to make that t-shirt you, <laughs> you absolutely should so we i could talk to you forever you're so brilliant i want to have yeah, you I back know. we always end with the same two questions what is your biggest defective character the thing that you have had to either overcome generally in your life or even something you're working on in the in the mo immediately now? I would say it's 
I don't trust my intuition. Mm. And it's a very, I've, I've Do not, you think that comes from where you grew up? Yes, and also because I'm very scientific minded. Right. So I always, like, how do I know something? And right, the, the definition right, right. of intuition is that you you believe something, but you don't know quite why. You don't know the steps of how you got there. But it's a gut, right? It's like <laughs> coming from some like very visceral. I'm laughing. Gut feeling. Only because Peter Bogosian and I got into a huge debate about this about. when I did a podcast with him, but my Zoom died. So I don't have it. We lost it, which is. But we got into this whole thing podcast. because he he we got most of the podcast, which okay. is fine. But we lost the whole part where we were debating intuition because I live by my gut. I know. I'm I know just that. like I get gut instincts, and in my whole life it's really all I've had to go by because I lived in so much chaos that I yeah. didn't. I only had my gut, and I and it was a guiding light for you. Your gut has proven right. Yeah. And I always I was saying to Peter, you know, you don't ever hear anyone say I never should have listened to my gut. You will never, ever hear those words. But that that might be because of confirmation bias. Well, that's exactly what he said. He was like, you only (laughs) remember the wins, Bridget. You're only going to remember the wins. You're not going to remember that time you had a gut instinct and that it was wrong. It's funny. Because like people like Peter and Sam Harris are my intellectual bedrocks. Yeah. You know, they were my heroes growing up. And oh my God, I sound like so, I have so much younger than them, but I am actually. Yeah. And I think people that, that sort of are, are naturally disposed to the STEM side of things that, you know, the, the, your more logic dominant, mm-hmm. ignore this gut feeling. They ignore intuition. They actually distrust it. I actively they, he distrust does. Mine. He does too. Yeah. And I feel like for me, it's an animal instinct that we don't listen to because we've put so much authority in our mind. Right. And so I I don't really trust my mind. Really? I have the total the opposite. The only thing I can trust, but I, I have I'm no to trust that. of my mind because I'm an ad- addict. And so I can I've learned very at a very young age and and for years that I can rationalize anything. But your mind is fixing your mind. So you should trust your mind. It, it, I use a 12-step program, which gives me a framework, and I have to run things by people that are outside of me often because I don't, my first thought is usually not the best thought, and that is just the truth of my, that's been true. And so I run things by other people because I'm like, hey, is this crazy? Is this real? Is this the perception real of the, uh, is my perception of this accurate? Because I don't, I don't trust my mind. My mind will tell me anything. My mind historically has told me anything to get, uh, even during this whole, so this is a great example of what I've always been afraid of. Did I come, I was a factory settings, very liberal. Am I coming center because I woke up and it's just having this more information that I am now exposed to. And yes, I think that's part of it. Or is it my lizard brain adapting to survive? I don't know. I don't trust that it's not, there isn't part of that going on. Do you know? You can't be sure. I can't be sure. Okay. So yeah, it was so interesting. I wish I still had that conversation with him, but it's also one of those things where I'm like, no, that was ours. That was for that was for that was her. I, I think one of one of the greatest uh, the the errors I sort of made in terms of um, my approach was that I've overvalued logic over right. intuition, and I'm starting to see the the benefits of it. I'm how do you differentiate it? it, like in in your body or how do so you how- exactly what I said so if okay so you ask somebody okay why did you pick this stock or why you ask Warren Buffett for example like why did you invest in this and and if he can explain to you the logical steps of how he came to embrace that position or why he views somebody as bad or good what as the supporting evidence if you know those steps that's not your gut you've rationalized you've thought mm-hmm. about it mm-hmm. your gut is something that just tells you this person is bad mm-hmm. you don't know why mm-hmm. and you can't say why mm-hmm. and it's it's nebulous mm-hmm. and and that in and of itself is not sufficient to explain to anybody else except you right that's what a gut feeling is mine originates in my body so i can tell the difference between a thought I'm having in my brain and an intuition. Yeah, but you, you, that, that assumes that, that rhetoric assumes that your body and mind are separate. No, I mean, I feel a gut instinct in my stomach. 
Really? Yeah, I don't feel it in my... Okay, but in you, my... Have an enteric, you have an enteric nervous system, right? So the brain and the stomach are connected there. Of course, nervous. of yeah, course. Yeah. But I'm saying I, I can tell when something is an intuitive rea- gut reaction because the feeling originates down here and it's not coming from up in my brain. It doesn't, it's like, it's hard for me to describe. I can't even describe it. It's, it's just that if I, if something triggers a gut instinct, it literally, I feel it in my gut and I'll get like, I was, I just had an experience with this woman. I used to get anxiety and I never knew where it originated from. And now in sobriety, being sober all the time, I think that it's a red flag, six years almost. I think it's a red flag. It's like something that's, it's information that I can't process. I don't necessarily have something trying, it's like the parts of my brain that might put patterns together is recognizing something, but Mm. I can't put my finger on it. And so it manifests as anxiety. And so I was with this girl and she's like, uh, we were having this conversation and I was getting anxiety as she was talking and I straight up was like, you're lying to me. And she's like, no, no you're not I'm not lying da 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 and then it turned out she was lying to me and it was one of those things where I I just I could never have explained it in the moment it was just because I was getting anxiety and I recognized that I was getting this weird anxiety and I didn't know why and then it turned out to be accurate but it could be that you're just so good at reading people and you've you've become so accustomed to taking in body language like you know some people have body right language right it's 75 oh, percent yeah, but so it's it's there is a total rational basis for why you believe what you believe. Right. You're just experiencing it at a visceral level through your organs almost that is not happening up here. Right. right? It's like you skip that process, but by no means is it not rational. You right. just may, and it's also just time, right? Like so I think the more sample the more the more data you've collected. So the more lying assholes you've dealt with in your life, the more you're gonna be in tune to what signs give away a lying asshole <laughs> so and, apparently and s- i've been around a lot of lying assholes right, right. <laughs> but, yeah, i mean I yeah there's that argument but it it's still whatever rational explanation there is for my gut i still can i have a good instinct or what whatever i mean i don't know what do you describe what's the difference between intuition and instinct oh uh, it's very similar i just i think like an intuition is just Instinct is more it, it when, when the word instinct to me sort of signals a more like evolutionary um, justification for something. Mm-hmm. Like dogs have instincts uh, because they were wired evolutionarily. But don't we have instincts as animals? We we obviously we do. Right. But I think we've tuned them out. Right. A lot. We've overridden a lot of a lot of things. And, and in this fact, is why I don't trust my brain. But almost everything that we think is moral could be said to go against. A biological instinct like it could be a biological instinct to kill this right. person because you know they've done something mm-hmm. but the moral thing to do is to not because not because we, right. we, we don't take <laughs> judicious matters into our own hands right but the the instinct told us this is something that right you know, he's an enemy right should be killed eliminated from the gene pool whatever it is mm-hmm. you know he slept with your wife right so, crimes of passion right exactly they're like a real thing so i think that's that's the difference intuition is it's not necessarily that intuition is not necessarily a uh, something that's wired guided by evolution it's just it's something that's happening on a gut level maybe in your lifetime you have collected enough evidence to know how mm-hmm. you feel about something but it's not necessarily explicitly something that's like you know an evolutionarily guided god this is why it's know. so hard for you to trust your intuition yeah because you're trying to rationalize something that's irrational. <laughs> I know, I know. But, but I think I'm more aware of that. Jonathan Haidt played a big role in in sort of making me realize that I've overvalued logic. And how did he do that? Because he, he wrote that book about the moral foundations and about system righteous, one and system two. Was that Righteous Mind? Righteous Mind, yep. yeah. Yeah, um, which is, it's a really powerful book for me because it really explains... It shows you that people come to their conclusions. It's like it's like okay, there's the political. I think it's political. on the shelf over here. Oh, really? Maybe, perhaps, yeah. Because it's like if you if you take an issue such as like the final thing is say somebody's political opinion, right? Mm-hmm. What leads to that? So first, you have to have a view of human nature. What do you think? Are people naturally are are people all people innocent until pr- proven guilty, or other pe- other people? Guilty to proven innocent. How you view human nature, how you view all these things, kind of lead up to what you view 
you know, your, your political views are. And what Jonathan Haidt showed was that it's not that Republicans are immoral or Democrats want to kill babies. It's that it's that they value different aspects of morality and they've put priorities on different points in the system. Mm. And, and for example, Republicans tend to value loyalty more than Democrats, um, more than liberals. Right. And, you know, it's funny because it manifests itself, that one fact manifests itself in behaviors. <laughs> well, beha- well, political, but, but also uh, dogs. Right. So Republicans tend to like dogs. Right. So if you watch Fox News, you're going to watch, you're going to see a lot of dog food commercials, but if you watch MSNBC, it's all friskies for the cats. Oh, interesting. Um, and, and it leads to consumer choices. You wow. know, everything's just kind of linked to this, like how you view this moral foundation, mm-hmm. what you value. And it's, it's, I find that really fascinating. That's so cool. So what is your greatest asset? My greatest asset. Um, This is always harder for people. hmm. I'm always fascinated that it's much easier for people to find something wrong with themselves than to think about what's amazing about themselves. In my case, it's also like culturally programmed. Yeah, Uh, uh, to be like not humble. It's just like you're a piece of shit until you you never get that pat on the back. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not supposed. Isn't the Asian dad memes? (laughs) Yeah, is which which are hilarious. Um. It's not one thing, but I think it's a combination of things. I think um, I would say I would say I would say my greatest asset is the ability to kind of connect with most people, despite like depending on their. You talk about political silos now; they're cultural silos. Mm-hmm. I feel like I can bridge the cultural mm-hmm, silos, mm-hmm. so people wouldn't expect like if you. On paper, oh, somebody educated like coastal liberal elite in Boston would not be expected to connect with a gun-toting hunter from Alabama. Right. I can. Right. I like WWE. I eat McDonald's still. Like there are just certain. I don't know. There. But do you like just, people? I'm a bit of a misanthrope. Okay. But I don't like crowds. But right. I like people one on one. Yeah, I feel like you like individuals. I do. Yeah. I prefer that. Or a very small group. So like mm. anything more than four freaks me out. I, I'm not I don't like like the party settings or, or mm-hmm. like music fest oh my god, the, the my greatest hell will be a music festival <laughs> or, or Burning Man or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Where it's just ton of people overstimulation. <laughs> Carol you know. Roth was saying this the other night that her hell is waking up one day and being in Burning Man. Really? <laughs> oh my God. There's so many kindred spirits yeah. in our weird group. I, I, did know. Not know, I did not know this. And I took to Burning Man like a fish to water. Really? <laughs> yeah. You did? Wait, so you've actually been? I went sober. Yeah. But you like it and you would go I back. loved it. But that's me. That's, that's like, I would say that is, that's just also what makes me, I'm very adaptable you know I moved a lot growing up and I'm flexible and so you can p- kind of put me in any situation and be like wow she's like a fish to water but I think it's just my ability to from going to 12 schools in 12 years or whatever I just know how to that's adapt. why you're not a snowflake though <laughs> because you are adaptable you I, I just think that that's a good survivor no, technique extremely and I think that if you looked at the kind of ideological enemies we talk about a lot, the people who are very authoritarian on the extremes, they're not adaptable. Mm -hmm. It's precisely the thing that, the trait that they don't have, actually. I think you are definitely a bridge. I mean, even since I've seen you, you, even just what you do for your job and your business that you started is- Actually, it's a building a cultural cultural bridge. Yeah, Yeah. and that's so- imperative now more than ever before if you're gonna have a gift that is the one that we need right right where can we find you um on twitter on twitter anywhere okay what's Um, it where my my handle is at miss ms mel chen and um my website if you want to want to look at the organization and what we do it's um ideas beyond borders dot org uh, we have a library site which which links to that. The the actual library where all the Arabic free Arabic content is hosted on is uh, it's Beit Al Hikma 2.0. It means the House of Wisdom. You'll find it on the main website. It links out, and there's English versions of it too. And we have book summaries of you know Sam Harris's books, Stephen Pinker's books, all done in Arabic and English. So there's a lot of content on 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 the website, so you can check that out. Great. 
Well, thank you so much. I know you have to get going, oh, but I you, love Bridget. you. It's always a pleasure. Oh, Come back anytime. Okay. If you write a book, which you should. No, you should. Oh, we'll get there. <laughs> thank you. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Here we go. We're off. <laughs> Well, we've come out of the doldrums. We have. We've emerged victorious and alive. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rough month, man. It was, I, I weirdly, it was rough, like emotionally, but I actually still feel like it was a good month. <laughs> uh -huh. No, I think that's like, true. Like I was pretty productive considering. That's true. And just being so engaged in the, in the sobriety and program. Mm -hmm. So grounding. Mm-hmm. I just want to, I want to read for like a year. I keep telling myself this lie that things will slow down. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and you'll finally have time to read. <laughs> <laughs> and I have some time, but not as much time. It's like, I just want to take one year off and shut down completely and read only. Well, you can do that after you fake your death. Yeah. You'll just spend all your free time reading. Uh, but you. Every time I listen to the podcast, though, you're always talking about a new book. I know. That you're reading. I'm always you're reading, reading like eight different books at a time. But I, I think like. that's the problem is that I'm not finishing them, so I'll feel better when I'm I because I'm always reading so many at once, mm -hmm. and then I get distracted by a new one. So I have like thirty in the works, <laughs> in various stages of reading, and then I like this one, the big hot cheap. You know, people are always worried about Texas and I started reading it and it's all about the genius of the Texas Constitution and why basically Texas could never become California. Oh. And I know enough to know that that's true, but not enough to know why. To understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've only read enough to understand that it's true, but not enough to explain why. <laughs> so I'm like, don't worry. Ca Texas could never become California. It's in their constitution. Then people are like, why? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, I haven't <laughs> gotten that far. I haven't gotten to that chapter yet. <laughs> like, I got distracted by the gene book I was talking about with Melissa Chen. I love that book. <laughs> but then I can only read like, and now I have everyone reading Mediated. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister called me. She's like, that book's hard. I'm like, yeah, I know. I've read it every year for like 13 years and I still it's don't understand still it. still absorbing. I need to reread it. I've, um, it's been a while since I've given that a reread. It's well, so I, good. It's just, it's true though. You have to stop and go back Process. and reread the sentences and. Oh, every page is dense, but it's, but it's readable. It's like it is. every That's page what I like is about brilliant him. Yeah, and there's so much information on it and it is slower reading, but it's not incomprehensible. No, and most of the stuff that I've read in that genre since, now that I've been reading all of this stuff about postmodernism and being exposed to so much of it from James Lindsay and Helen Pleckrose, and it's kind of boring and incomprehensible usually when people write about it. Mm -hmm. So at least he's a good writer. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about the book. He's just funny. It's so good. It's so good. I know. He emailed me again, and I was like, he must have experienced some kind of surge because... <laughs> because You've been mentioning it all over the place and on Joe. Yeah, I'm sure it was like, why did I sell a hundred copies of my book randomly? From my or two even ten. <laughs> yeah, even ten. Even if ten people bought that book, and that like it, it would be definitely weird because it's like a 2006 <laughs> book. I saw a review. The only reason I bought it was I saw a review of it in the New York Times, and I was like, I have to have that book. Mm -hmm. It was just something that jumped out to me. Mm -hmm. And then I searched it down and mm -hmm. got it. And it sh I, it should have done so much better, but I feel like maybe it was ahead of its time. It's like one of those books that if you read now, you're like, God, this guy. It, it, it was 15 years ahead of its time. It's like it what predicted. Joe said. It's so weird when someone just sees that crest. I right. mean, he has the whole chapter about um, identity politics mm -hmm. in there. And I remember when you were reading it and I like you were telling me about it and I went and bought a copy. And I mean, you look at my copy, you look at your copy, it's just covered in writing. Like we were, I was I writing know. in it and underlining things. And definitions so of words. brilliant. Like yeah. I j legitimately looked up epistemology every time I read that book for the past 13 years. And I still, I just understood what that word means like this year. Uh-huh. I, I I just didn't understand the word. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, how do I know what I know about this word? <laughs> well, yeah. 
huge advocate for Mediated. It's such a good book. And now I'm rereading The Body Meets the... the I have 17 books open I around I know, me. and it's you're like, always talking about... I have such ADD. I just ones. need to freaking... But you're always down. reading good books. I mean, it's it's a lot of interesting books. Oh, and we didn't mention, because we were so busy with Our talking music. about Joe last week, that, yeah, we have a new theme song, guys. I don't know if anyone's noticed. We but... got a fancy composer. <laughs> we got an awesome composer who's my friend from football, touch football, Jared Elias. We'll give him a shout out. Jared's great. He's he nailed it. Fantastic. We had one conversation about what, how you know he asked me kind of the origin and i told him about how it was really the whole concept was in this um rv that when i used to work up on the farm and i had the pirate radio station and there we had the we just would broadcast from this crazy little rv in the middle of the woods and just gave him the whole vibe and the whole vibe of the show and what i what it is now and I wanted it to feel open and kind like of familiar. Welcoming yeah. and familiar. And, and then he nailed it on one shot. Went right out of the gates, he sent it to us and was like, oh my God, it's perfect. It's, it's perfect. exactly what we wanted. The, I the love total, it. it evokes the, ex- the exact feel. I know. I love wanted. it. It makes me want to be like, pull up and have a lemonade and right. tell me your life story. Have some tea or coffee or whatever. Come on and sit down on my front Let's porch. Sit on the rocking chair and. <laughs> chat talk about <laughs> life and things <laughs> i know i love it so shout out to jared he is brilliant we will be using him in the future for all of our composing needs yeah and if you and if, happen to be someone who needs a composer for something reach out to reach out to us and we'll send you his contact info because he is amazing and speaking of reaching out to us even though we have 12 email addresses <laughs> It's very hard to find one for me in particular, <laughs> as I've learned since I was on Joe Rogan and people have yelled at me for having an impossible way to find me. <laughs> but I got invited or put in touch with this person who does this huge event and it's a very like it's like thought leaders uh-huh. and you have to kind of be invited to go to this event and um, because they curate everybody. You're sitting at dinner with all these people and they want to make sure that you're not an asshole, essentially. Right. And so he was, and I had a little interview today and he starts talking about, he's like, can you, s- okay, it sounds good after this long conversation about what I do, which is very hard to explain. And then he said, okay, can you send me a bio and maybe some links to some of your work? And and just, you know, give me a general sense because I went to your website, <laughs> BridgetPedicy.com. <laughs> and he said, and it's really just two pictures of you. And then when you scroll down, you're like, oh, there's an about about me button. But then it just takes you back to the top of the page. Everyone needs to go to BridgetFantasy.com and look at this because it's literally two pictures of Bridget and it says Bridget Fantasy, writer, comedian, verified nobody. <laughs> and then down at the bottom, there's a button about about me and you click on it and it just <laughs> scrolls back up to the top of the page. <laughs> It's so and he, funny. And he told me that he thought that I was trolling him. <laughs> that it was like a troll site. Uh, and yeah. He's like, okay. And so then he thought he did, that it was a mistake. And so he clicked it again. He was like, nope, nope. That's definitely where the button goes. <laughs> it's definitely like, I've never seen anything like this. This is like if someone asked me to do a TED Talk and then went to look, look me up. <laughs> And this is what they are confronted with <laughs> and trying to find any information about me. And he's like, trust me, it's not hard to, f- it's hard to figure out who you are when you Google you. <laughs> it's like pictures of boobs, interview with Glenn Beck, writer for Playboy, Federalist. Like, what the fuck is going on it's here? YouTube show, wh- podcast. No, it's insane. It's just as insane as I always wanted. <laughs> and then speaking of... Oh, so so he was giving me shit about that. And it's funny because we were pushing to get the store up and like all these things. And there's just certain projects I want to finish before the end of the year. BridgetFetacy.com having being a landing spot for like podcasts, 
YouTube. Right. Just a Patreon. place that collates everything, everything that you so do. Everything so that you can go and see my spot. bio maybe right there. Wow. How logical would that be? <laughs> and professional. Right. And instead, it's like a freaking practical joke. <laughs> <laughs> But it makes for a great story. <laughs> I'm like, like, hi, Bridget. This is uh, Bill Gates calling. We're trying to figure out who the hell you are. And we can't. Ooh, what exactly do you do? Yeah. He's like, any kind of way. I probably will never hear from him again. I sent him some links and like a bio and promised him I would get that fixed up. Leader of a media cul-de-sac. What if I just had thought leader like T-H-O-T? <laughs> <laughs> Media cul-de-sac ruler. Media cul-de-sac. Did you know the plural of cul-de-sac is culs de sac Ew. <laughs> Maggie. <laughs> Why do you have to ruin my day with all of these <laughs> grammatical facts? Isn't that so weird? That's yeah. so strange to me. It's called, well, cul de sac is kind of gross. <laughs> so we're laughing again and not crying. It was a couple of rough weeks there. Fetacy Inc. has turned a corner. <laughs> we have. We're in we're in Scorpio now. It's, this is Bridget's time to shine. It's time for me to rise like a phoenix out of the ashes of the wreckage of my past. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the unicorn stats father. What it's that? weird because I was reading the Addicted to Doom piece t- today that I wrote for The Fix like three or two years ago. Oh, yeah. Or almost three years ago now. And I talk about unicorns and dumpster fires in that piece. Weird. Yeah. Very predictive. I know. Mm-hmm. So Bridget's a psychic. We know this already, though. It is weird to have all of the... Um, like burning references when like all of LA is burning. And that's the weird thing too is everyone's like, I hope you're okay because all they see are in the media and we're right. like, tra la la, like two miles away. It's I not know. far. It's not far. And we're like, oh, there, oh yeah, the fire. Is that still going? <laughs> yeah, you're just, you're so used to like being surrounded by disaster in LA. You don't even really notice what's happening. Yeah, I mean, those poor firefighters, man. I, I get really outraged about the um, $2 a day inmates. I don't even know how that shit's legal. The $2 a day inmates? All the inmates fight fires, and it's freaking, they get paid like $2 a day. I didn't know that. Yeah, it shouldn't even be legal. No. It's fucking bullshit. That's insane. Yeah, it is it is insane. It's bullshit. I don't even know how it's legal. I want It's the kind of prison reform I care about. Wow. I had no idea. The more you know, the more you want to riot. <laughs> Don't so even get me started. We learned two PG&E. new things today: Culls de sac and prison prison inmates fighting fires. And Bridget's gonna have Gary Newsom recalled. <laughs> oh yeah, but you got to check out Twitter for that though. <laughs> I'm gonna start. A cliffhanger for next time. My political, <laughs> my political career began with a takedown, <laughs> <laughs> taking a trust fund baby down. My dreams come true. Have a good week. <laughs> We'd like to thank our sponsors this week: Manscaped and The Spectator. Support for Walk-ins Welcome comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your man's family jewels. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WALKIN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Do your ladies a favor. Hit manscaped.com up and use the code WALKIN. They'll thank you. The Spectator is the longest running magazine in the English language and it's now getting ready to launch its US edition. If you sign up now, you'll get your first issue free. So just go to spectator.us slash subscribe and use offer code WALKIN. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> It's the dumbest line. <laughs>